Welcome to Autism Me Goodness. My name is Tiffany. Um, I feel like it's been a long weekend. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. It feels like I did a lot, but did nothing at the same time, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Um, took the kids shopping today. Um, we, I think last week, last week, we went through his clothes because I was noticing he was wearing shirts that were clearly too small to school. So I had stopped him one time. It was one that was egregious. It was like borderline crop top. I was like, okay, dude, like let's, I stopped him before he went to school. So, um, <laughs> and had him change shirts. So then that prompted me, like, let's go through your shirts and see what might be too small. Um, and we got rid of a substantial amount of his t-shirts. Um, he already had a lot of t-shirts. So we got rid of, about half of his t-shirts maybe more than half so i thought it was a good time to like let's you know go shopping and re-up your um your summer top game so um took him shopping um he actually still has gift cards from when he graduated from high school last year and um so he used his target gift card and bought some really cool tops he actually has really good taste actually um i made him pick everything i said you just go pick out you know, start with three tops. Let's see how they fit to get our idea what size. And then he ended up getting like five tops and like three pairs of new swim trunks for like $180. And then he had a $50 gift card. So he technically only spent $130 of his own money. So I think he did pretty good. So then we're going to do the same thing with his shorts and his pants. Um, it, it's, if you ever saw him, he kind of have a, has a swimmer's build, like broad chest. So, it's so he was some small men small he still fits um but depending on the cut of the shirt he might have to go to a medium so there was like one shirt that he bought because it's a slim cut button down shirt he had to go up to a medium because the chest was just like too tight because his heartbeat um so yeah so um just trying to um get clothes to fit our body um and making sure he's i kind of educated him on like what what's the right fit for your shirt because um for the most part he's still gonna he still would try to wear it um if he can get it on so we kind of got all the stuff so just part of being an autism parent just being mindful of um the kid wearing <laughs> too small clothes um but uh that was i think the biggest thing this weekend is just taking him shopping and having him go do that experience of picking out his own clothes and expressing his own personal style um but today I'm going to talk about, um, I'm actually inspired by um, an autism mom that I follow on Instagram. Um, she's actually in the UK. Um, her uh, Instagram uh, page is Raising Kevin. Um, she has a son that's also 18. They're also black. Um, so this is why what prompted me to follow them. Um, but yes, they're in the UK. He's 18. And I follow them. Uh, I would say Kevin, her son... It seems like his there's some similarities with his autism and James's autism, but as we said before, it's a spectrum. There's no two people that are alike, so there are a few similarities. I think he's kind of cute. And he's a really fun guy. Um, a lot of time, their banter is um, he doesn't like curse words. What I had mentioned before, Juju finds curse words funny, um, except like when I say them. But anyway, um, he like her son just doesn't like them. He like you know gets he doesn't like angry like you know rage he just like oh no i can't believe you said that you know it's just the cutest thing but anyway i'll put her um her instagram name on there please give her a follow because she's um she and kevin are really cool and their family um but she had posted something that kind of sparked my um creativity if you will um i try i think the i had a few goals when i decided to start this and you know i'm starting it small i'm just doing it how i want to do it Whoever watches, watches. Whoever doesn't, doesn't. I'm not trying to do this to be an influencer. I'm not trying. I'm trying to do this to like gather, um, re gather, make this a resource so that I can just kind of gather content and be able to share it out to people who are new to autism, want to learn more about autism, just in general, be able to share my experience. So you can either, you know, you can learn more about autism. You can learn more about, um, just experiences you might be able to if you have a child with autism you may be able to get some um, knowledge or resources from this but um it was just always just 
somewhere I could just kind of unload the things that are all in my brain that I've just kind of been doing in autopilot and just um, being able to share them with others. So, um, but anyway, she had posted um, something on her Instagram and she had said, um, I'm going to actually read it. I'm going to show the screenshot too. But she said, um, social media is fake. I mostly share all smiles. Here are some of my worries as a parent of a child with autism that I don't share online. So um, I always try to, um, like you want to, you want to be all, you want to be positive. You want to celebrate small wins, but I also want to also share other things like the not so good too. Because um, I like I've said it before, James Senior said it. Like some days are good, some days yikes so it's like i don't even know what to say it's like it's just you kind of get what you get um and you just deal with it the best way you can but these are kind of like things that um i can relate that she had posts that she worries about so i'll kind of go through the few things she talked about and then uh relate it back to my experience so the first thing she would said I spend a ridiculous amount of time worrying about my son's future. I know my son is thriving now with support, but then again, I know I don't, I won't be here forever and I worry what will happen then. So I think I've probably said this quite a few times, like, I can't get on here and say with certainty I know what the future looks like. Um, I just can't right now. Um, I know that's something a lot of people don't want to hear. They just assume that we know, but we really don't. Um, I think for right now, we're his guardians. If something happens to both of us, we have a backup guardian. But outside of that, um, it's more I'm worried about his mental state without me. Um, we're very close and I'm, I'm, I'm measuring my words because, um, this is a lot for me, um, to talk about, but again, I do this so that I can share my experiences to help others. Um, we're very close. Um, and throughout these years, We've been through a lot. So, um, me and him. I'm not even, let's take dad out the situation. Just me and him. It's been kind of me and him going through a lot together. And me um, learning about him, learning about what he needs, learning how to support him. Yeah, I'm just I'm just speaking of our men, J James the Second's relationship. And um, he... He leans on me a lot because of that. And I'm trying to arm him with the tools and the resources that will help him be able to stand on his own, be able to advocate for himself. I'm trying to give him those tools. But at the same token, I'm not going to abandon him and not help him. So I'm trying to just balance that out. So, but if something happens to me, he has James Sr., but it's it's just not me. So um, I just worry about that and just worry about how he would handle that. Um, but I can't control that. So um, just, A, worrying about if I just go and then worrying about if he doesn't have either of us and then what that looks like for him if he's alone in this world. Like, what does that look like? Um, so everything we're doing is to try to get him in a position where he can, you know, take care of himself. But that worry is just not going to go away. It's just going to be persistent. Um, and I don't really know how to stop it. <laughs> so um, it, it's just it's just going to be a thing. Um, and it, that's just part of what you sign up for a little bit. Well, no one really signs up for it. It's what they, you get signed up for. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's something that I worry about a lot. And like, you know, will he continue to thrive if I'm not here or if neither of us are here? Um, that is a, a, a real and true concern and worry. So, um, but like I said, every day we try to, like we're trying to get him to a point where he can get a job. We're, we're just trying our best with the tools we have right now, but it is not a hundred, 
it's not defined at all right now. It's it's more of just trying to figure it out um, as much as we can. Um, but the immediate thing is like, where's Guardians? He has a backup Guardian if something happens to both of us. Um, but other than that, it's really us trying to build him up to be able to get in a position where he can take care of himself. Sorry, I didn't expect to get weepy off the first one, but I'm going to power through the rest of these. <laughs> um, okay, number two. Um, I worry a lot about my son's safety. As a black boy living in London, the stereotypes aren't always kind. I can't help the crippling anxiety I feel when he's out alone. Sometimes I don't even want him out of my sight. <laughs> so, yes, we're not in London, but we are black people in America. That's scary enough. So, I, um, so what I've, he's not alone alone. He doesn't go out in the world alone, which we're working towards that uh, with him getting employment, um, looking to maybe, you know, figuring out how he can you know, get there by himself. Like through um, we have not like necessarily like um, there's a bus. Uh, it's the North Oakland Transportation Authority, where it's like the smaller bus that will take you from door to door. You call and set up the pickup time. And um, I can't remember. Um, it's called it used to be called something else. But basically within like the our service area they, they would take him like different places he would call and set up appointments to have them pick him up drop him off and then prick him up bring him back um so um eventually i want to practice that to see if he's able to do that and like show him how to use that but for the most part he's not really like he doesn't go out alone or he doesn't um he doesn't well, he, like, of course he goes to school without us, but he's not, like, alone. Like, he never, like, goes out and just walks around and just goes off alone. Um, but I'd like to change that. I'd like to get him to a point where he is able to go somewhere alone. But then also I am very terrified. Um, as a young black man in America, and the add on top of that he has autism, if, um, the police approach him and he's scared, like, he'll act if he acts erratic or if he has anxiety um just really nervous or if he's out in a situation where he's uncomfortable and he acts out and he, we're not with him and people don't know what that is um it's hard because um as much as you want the world to um understand and accept um your young adult child with autism like this world is not meant for him. So I don't want them to see him as a threat. Um, so um, having him out in the world without anyone like by himself navigating, that's, that is a genuine fear. Um, so um, again, one of those things like not really sure how to combat that. Um, trying to figure out how it makes sense to have him have those opportunities to be able to navigate by himself. Cause that's going to be important for independence. Um, so still trying to just sort through what makes sense and where those opportunities make sense and try to get him in that. Cause what we have done is we have talked to him about, I mean, I think a lot of black parents talk to their kids about how to deal with the police and how to navigate with the police. We've kind of had that same conversation with him. Um, but it's been more so about, um, trying to remain calm as possible um and if you can't ask if they can call your parents or something like that um but we just really focus on you know when you're talking to the police remain calm use your calm voice um try to relax um and just you know not give them a reason to be scared of you um it's sad that you know police officers a lot of them don't have training for someone with special needs. Um, and we've seen a lot of stories over the years of, you know, people with autism and other special needs or mental health issues that um, they just get shot. And, um, yeah, it's a genuine fear. So um, just want to be able to help him navigate through that and be able to get to a point where he had kind of explore by himself. Um, so, yes, stay tuned on that. There'll be more on that. Um uh, the next item she said, um, I often doubt myself and worry a lot about being a good parent and if I'm doing enough. I have an irrational fear about failing him and not doing everything possible to protect him. This worry often gets overwhelming to me. Man, sister, you're singing my song. 
<laughs> um, I mean, I feel kind of weird when people be like, oh, you're doing a great job. Oh, you're amazing. I'm like, I don't feel that I'm doing anything that any parent would do if given the situation. Um, and I know, we know there's deadbeat parents out there, of course. So, well, yeah, that that's like, you know, the worst case scenario. But if you're a parent, you, you care about your child, you're going to do what you can to make sure that they have a fulfilling life. And I feel that's what I'm doing. Um, I also feel like um, there are things I could have done better. There are things I've, you know, fit things I could have maybe tried to do. Um I'm always second guessing like everything essentially. Um, and there, again, there's not a, a lot I can do about that. I can only kind of do the best I can with what I have. Um, but, uh, I, I often wish his speech was a lot better. Um, his communication was a lot better. Um, I think that's the main thing that, that bothers me is sometimes is his communication, which to be honest, it's getting, it's, it's gotten much better over the years. It's like, it seems to be getting a little bit better every day. And like, um, especially when he speaks up for himself, those are like, that's one of my proud moments is when he does speak up, whether it's not, he's, he's being kind of a jerk and speaking back to me, but he is still advocating for himself or, you know, I, I want him to do that, even though it's like, Hey dude, you ain't got to talk to me like that though. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's just something, I think all parents have that where they, um, basically doubt themselves as a parent or uh, feel that they're not doing enough. Um, I'm, I'm still, he's about to be 19 years old and I'm still researching different things for autism and different treatments, different programs. Um, uh, constantly just trying to figure out, um, what, what's the best decision, um, evaluating where he's at. Like I'm just constantly on to try to stay on top of things. And then when I don't, I feel like I just totally messed up. But um, I'm trying to just work through that mentally to figure out the best way to um, reconcile that with myself and just um, celebrate those small wins. When you get a small win, you're like, okay, well, maybe I'm not. Or a lot of times I've been told James Sr., sometimes when I hear other parents' experiences, um, whether it be another parent with autism, a, a child with autism, or just like neuro parents with neurotypical kids, I'm like... Yeah, maybe I'm not doing that bad because some of these stories are like, ooh, ha, ooh. okay, <laughs> so I'm not going to do anything close to that, so or going through anything close to that, so um, so yeah, sometimes it feel that makes me feel a little bit better. Like, okay, maybe I'm not doing such a bad job. Um, the next thing she says, I feel guilt, guilty, or worry about my other children. And how having a sibling with special needs impacts them. I often wonder if they're getting the best of me too. And if I'll ever be able to fill, for fully meet every child's individual needs. While I don't have more than one child. I just have one child. I will say that there was a point in time where we were going to try to have another child. And that didn't pan out. But... My brain, the way my brain works, it kind of put me in a headspace of like, you know, well, this gives me the energy that I can focus all my all on him. I can't imagine at this point where we're at now trying to focus on another child, which that child at that point would, would, would be eight years old now, trying to deal with the elementary school child and their, you know, issues, concerns. And trying to deal with everything I'm dealing with on this side with James the second, I I cannot imagine. I I am burnt out with the one. <laughs> so, um, and they say God only gives you what you can handle. Well, yeah, this is what I can handle, and it's uh, sometimes I don't know if I'm handling it well, but um, it's hard. Um, and I think it's probably it's 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 already hard when you have multiple children and they're just all neurotypical. There's no neurodivergency at all. But when you have a special needs child and you are constantly putting a lot and pouring into that child and you're trying not to leave the other child children behind, like I, I can't imagine like that feeling, the feeling of guilt and just, um, um, but you can look at it as, you know, that, that hopefully those siblings that have a special needs, um, a brother or sister 
that it makes them more compassionate. Um, it um, makes them overall better people in the world. They understand how people are different. Um, not everyone's the same, and they understand what that means. And I hope that they see that you are doing your best and you are trying and you're um, giving them the love that they deserve, um, however it looks. Um, but I'd hope that they're able to spin that into something as positive as they can, given the situation. Uh, the next one, she has, okay. <laughs> I worry about my son having friends, real genuine friends. I often fear that people might take advantage of his kind heart and vulnerability. So, friends. <laughs> so, Yeah. So, um, when going back to when James was, um, I don't know, preschool age, he did not want to interact with children at all. Like he was in, in, at the daycare, um, off, they kind of had him set up off to the side, not because they wanted to segregate him, but because they felt he, he was more comfortable that way. And like, if any kid kind of wanted to come over, he kind of like, you know, acted out and didn't want to be around them. Um, but slowly, as he got used to other kids, um, he wanted to be more around them. And what I've seen over the years is that he does flock to neurotypical kids because he's trying to kind of like emulate them and understand how to be a kid. Um, so he's, he's kind of done that over the years. And it was a time where, um, when he uh, would go to YMCA for summer camp and I would come pick him up and I would always, they had like a big glass window and I kind of get a sneak peek of him before I walked in the building. So I kind of sat in the car and got a sneak peek of him. And there was like a, a circle of girls that kind of were just talking and he was like standing off to the side and just smiling. And he was kind of like, you know, just kind of rocking back and forth and just smiling. And you could tell he wanted to get in the conversation, but he just, he didn't know how to, or he didn't have the words, but he really wanted to engage. He just kind of stood there and kind of just smiled and was like, you know, trying to get into the conversation. Um, because he's so sweet, um, kids over the years have just like kind of flocked to him and liked him and claimed him as a friend, but he doesn't really have, um, how can I put it? The capacity to and initiate a friendship and um keep a friendship like he doesn't understand what that means so like there was like i want to say like fourth or fifth grade he had met this girl um her name was erica um come to find out long story short i'll tell this full story at some point but she was like his girlfriend she was neurotypical but she really liked him and um she would, you know, take care of him at school, um, you know, make sure that he was taken care of, um, was really, really sweet to him. And, um, I haven't met like her parents and we'd spend time, we'd go over their house and like, um, spend time they loved him, but because he doesn't have that capacity to keep a friendship it's dependent on me to keep in touch with these people in order for him to keep this friend like he's not asking me uh, like oh can I call Erica like he just he doesn't do that so he recognized that that's his friend but he doesn't understand that he needs to do things in order to keep a friendship to keep in touch to keep talking so they grew apart when they because when she went to uh when they went to middle school they went to two different schools so um they kind of fell apart I fell out of contact and then uh, I think her mom maybe reached out to me when they were in I think eighth grade maybe and then we met up and she was like a totally different person like you know she grew up and he like he was different he looked different but for the most part he acted still the same so it was kind of like you know it's not it wasn't really the same dynamic anymore and then he had a friend that he had met um Wow, this was maybe third grade he met. Um, and this kid really flocked to him too. And um, they would were at the same school, and I didn't know this, that they were still at the same school up until high school before we had moved from our previous school district when he was in 10th grade. And so I had got an email from his mom. Uh, it was basically with the, the school year uh, starting 11th grade. We had already moved 
the summer before. So he was starting 11th grade in the new school. And the mom of this kid had um, emailed me and said, hey, how are you doing? It was like maybe two or three weeks school. It was in session for the um, school year. And she said, hi, it's um, such and such's mom. Um, he said he hadn't seen James in school. We were getting worried. Are you guys okay? And I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea they were still going to the same school. She's like, yeah, they, they see, he sees them every day and he walks up to James and give him a fist bump every day. And he's been doing it for years and he noticed that he hadn't seen them. So he got concerned. I said, oh, well we moved. Um, I, I had, I just had no idea that he was still, he's all, oh, well, he's bummed out. Cause he like really misses seeing him. Um, and like I said, I had known because James doesn't talk about friends or James doesn't keep friendships or he doesn't know to say, well, I'm moving. I need your phone number. Can I keep in touch? So he doesn't know to do that. But his mom, the mom happened to reach out to me via email because she had my email. Um, and then the other thing about friends is that I have to put him in a situation to make friends. So like now that he's He's graduated high school. He's in like a post high school program. Um, and I feel he has a few friends there. Um, but for like socializing, he doesn't ask to go hang out with his friends. He just sits in his room. So I have to force him to go socialize. So we, like I said, we go bowling and he's made friends there. When you put him in social situation, he likes it, but he just doesn't initiate it. So it's like you have to make him do it. Um, so, um, just trying to work through that and just, um, figuring out how to get him out the house more so he can, you know, have friendships. The part about, you know, people taking advantage of him, um, yeah, that's a, that's a real, um, sometimes people suck. Um, yeah, we haven't, we've been fortunate where we haven't met those type of people, but it, it is a real concern. Um, don't want anybody to take advantage of him. And, you know, that's partially why we got guardianship too, is that we didn't want him to meet someone along the way and just randomly like try to take over his life and try to control him. Um, and we didn't have any legal recourse to help him. So that's partially why we did get the guardianship. But, um, you just want to make sure that you want to, you want people to have the best intentions, but you know, people might see him and see he's sweet and see that, you know, um, he has cognitive issues and try to, you know, steer him into a way or steer him to do things that aren't right. So, um, again, part of the fear about having him go out in the world alone and like, you know, have to have control over situations. So, um, it is, it is an overwhelming fear for me as well. Sometimes it's just, um, it's like you have to try to put him in the world, but the world is just so scary and so big. Um, Yeah, I don't know what else to add to that. Um, but yeah, friendships are, are hard for him. It's like, you know, he, he has the personality that attracts people to be his friend. It's just that he just doesn't have the capacity to like try to keep and, and know how to maintain those friendships. So the friend that I talked about that, you know, he grew up with and was, um, they were in high school and they would do the fist bump every day. We, um, we did connect because he, he has since graduated high school as well and he's off in college. So I try to encourage James to like, cause he has, he had, does has his phone, have his phone number now since we've reconnected with them to like text and check on him to make sure he's doing okay in college. So, um, I seen in the James's phone where he's done it a couple of times, but you know, his communication isn't, isn't the best. So he tries to say, you know, hi, how's college? And it's, it's, it's very cute. And he's very, the other, uh, the kids are very receptive. Like, Oh my God. Hi James. I'm so glad to see you hear from you. Da, da, da. So we're, we're, we're trying, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's not, um, it's not the typical, um, teenager friendship situation. Um, unfortunately, uh, the next one, I worry about myself too. I always feel like I'm functioning on autopilot and often the exhaustion is real. I worry about self neglect because my kids will always come first. I worry majorly about my mental health. So <laughs> yeah, about mental health. I, I would say I get autopilot. I think autopilot for a lot of moms, parents, whoever is a real thing. Um, 
like you get to the point where you just are doing the thing and you know you have to do the thing you have to do whatever and you're just going and you're not really you know putting a lot of thought into it or taking a break or taking a beat for yourself you're just kind of you know going in the autopilot mode so um I would say for me, um, I always feel that I have so much to do and I have no time to do it. And so I try to just go heads down and just get it done. And then, um, focus on other things later or put other things to the wayside um sorry i'm just sorry to be so wistful but just trying to just think of how to do best to describe the autopilot mode like as a sp it, it's like I, I thought about it the other day and it's like you know for the most part if you have a neurotypical child there becomes a point where you kind of let them go you're there as a support if they need you but for the most part they're living their lives they're doing whatever they're making their mistakes or whatever they're they're figuring out life um i still have to be so involved in every facet of his life and it's like it's going to be that way probably forever so, um, I'd hope it get to a point where he can, you know, be able to be self-sufficient, but I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and some days I think it was one time where, and like I had said earlier, we're close. So he, if there's something wrong, he wants to tell me. So, and he wants to talk to me. So I make sure I give him my attention. But sometimes it's exhausting. So, um, but I, I don't never want to show him that because I want him to always feel comfortable talking to me. And like I talk, told you, like his communication sometimes not the best. So when he's talking and talking to me, I, I'm stopping everything and just giving him my full attention. Like I'm not, yeah, I'm just, okay, you got, you got me for however long you need me to talk about whatever it is. Um, but then it, I get into a point where, I think I text, text my sister or my friend and it just said, I need a vacation where I don't have to deal with autism. I, I don't have to talk about autism. I don't have to be an autism mom. I just don't want to be, I don't want to do autism. I want to have an autism vacation. <laughs> um, and I don't even care if that sounds bad because dude, I just, some days I just don't, I don't, I, the best way I can try, it is exhausting. Like, it's tiring. And, um, I'm sorry this episode is a little bit of a downer, but I just wanted to be, have a real one, um, and just talk about worries. Um, but yeah, the, it is exhausting. You, you want to just curl up in a ball and just not get up and just sleep but you have some you have to do things so um and that like I think any mom can relate to that it's like you know we got to get up and do the mom thing but with me it's like well okay I have to plan out okay he has to do this this week he's not driving so who's got to take him to the stuff I got to take him to the stuff and I got to sit and wait for him and then I got to take him back and then I have to Oh, we have an open house at his school. I got to go to that because I got to figure out what's going on with his program. And, oh, I got to do his taxes because that's a thing now. I have to do his taxes. <laughs> and, oh, I got to make sure we uh, I follow up with MRS to make sure he can do the summer work program. I got to follow up on that to make sure he's in that. I got to follow up on this. I got to check into that. I got to make sure this happened. I got to do that. It's, it's just a lot. And so I try to... I think I mentioned before when I talked about self-care, I, I try to make time to make sure that I am taking care of myself, even if it's in like little frivolous ways, like, you know, getting my nails done, get my eyelash done. I, I've added getting facials uh, every, I think I'm doing every three months, yeah, every three months into the rotation. Just sometimes that I can just 
take time and just not have to think about anything or just do anything related to autism. I love my son so deeply, but it is exhausting sometimes. Like, because I, I don't, I don't get that handoff. I never am going to get that handoff of where like, okay, kid, go out in the world and figure it out. Like, I just, I don't have it. Not yet. Or I don't know ever, but this is, it is what it is. And, um, you try to do the best you can with what you got. And, uh, I try to make sure that I, um, you know what? I will say doing these episodes every week, regardless if anybody's watching them or not, I, know I get like maybe 33 views, which I'm thankful for the 33 views. It's great. Um, this is therapeutic to get this off my chest. It is therapeutic to talk about it. And I know somebody else out there that feels the same way and you shouldn't feel bad about it. Like it's true. Like, you know, it is what it is exhausting. It's a lot. It's a big, it's a big responsibility. Um, so, you know, you just try to do what you can with what you have. Um, I think that was the last thing she had on her post. I want to still give a shout out to the Raising Kevin Instagram page. They are adorable. I do love them. I do hope you follow them, um, with their little British accents, <laughs> but they're very cute. Um, and yeah, if I ever find any other, um, there's a couple other, I don't overwhelm my Instagram with like, autism well I follow like Holly Robinson Pete of course and um I think there's like a, just a general autism awareness um page on Instagram that I follow but um and it's more that's I think it's come up in my algorithm because it's April um and I think because I have like autism mom in my bio on Instagram so I do get like some stuff um and I, I've hashtagged a lot of these posts uh autism goodness, I think that's also getting in my algorithm of uh, all the autism stuff. So I try not to bombard myself with it because, like I said, sometimes I do need a break. Um, but I do find that doing this every week is therapeutic to me. Um, like I said, whether you watch it or not, I got it off my chest. It's like me almost doing a journal. Um, I could just talk about whatever. And hopefully it helps someone else. Um, it's helping me, I feel. Um, but yeah, if you would like me to cover off on anything in a new future episode, please let me know. Um, please like and subscribe. Um, I'll see if I can bring James back on and see if he wants to talk about anything. I try to bring him on sparingly, but I might just do maybe some footage of just him doing activities. Um, we have a couple things coming up, um, in the next week couple weeks or so we're going out on an activity so i might do some video footage there it'd be exciting for you guys to see that but um yeah i hope you enjoyed and uh till the next time i will see you later bye <laughs>